we're dangerously close. So close. You can you can almost taste it. You can almost feel it. Gird your loins, ladies and germs. Because we're one episode number away from from some debauchery. Indeed. We have no plans. <laughs> Too bad this is the last episode we'll ever film. Uh, we don't... Nothing's on film. It's digitally recorded. I haven't shot anything on film in years. Well, too bad this is the only... Not the last podcast we'll ever do on on Fruit by the Foot. No film, just Fruit by the Foot. It has a similar shape to film. On that note, thank you for watching this episode. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why we're never doing another episode, because he's done with my bullshit. Exactly, exactly. This is, of course, episode 68 of the Duels and Manadorks podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And Duels and Manadorks, of course, a D&D and MTG podcast where we talk about Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering, other tabletop RPGs and TCGs as well. Basically all of the acronyms, Daggerheart from time to time. Yeah. You know how it is. Love an acronym. You know how it is. Watsy. Watsy D and D, Ulalek MTG. That's not an acronym. Ulalek is the name of a card. Fab, Fab, Flesh and Blood. Oh, flesh we've and never blood. once talked about Flesh and Blood. So I am. I did sign up for a Flesh and Blood Learn to Play at Gen Con. I, I I was considering doing that. I have that on my wish list. I, I, I we need to we need to converse about. It. We're going to Gen Con. Uh, yeah. So if you happen to be in Indianapolis and you're going to the convention at Gen Con, please uh, let us know and and you can come say hi and we can give you a free magic card or stickers or both <laughs> dice. Oh my God! I'm gonna bring all the fucking spin downs we got. There you go. Gonna be handing out spin downs like left and right at Gen Con. Probably I'll for, I'll probably forget to bring it. But uh, if we constantly forget to bring, to do the things that we. We're like I've, mm-hmm. we, have, we we forgot uh, we have stickers. Mm-hmm. We've had stickers for a long time. I don't we know do. where they are. And not like not like sticker sheet stickers, but no. like actual stickers. Yeah, we're not just uh, we're not saying hey, you did a good job by coming to Gen Con and sticking our logo on you. No, we're handing you a piece of yeah. of of uh, plastic with adhesive on the back, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and attach that adhesive is paper that you can peel yeah. off the paper and stick. I'm explaining how stickers work. Yeah. Would you would you care to continue to mansplain on on this great Pride Month that we are in and on Pride Month <laughs> and on Pride Month? <laughs> That's my favorite thing about the month of June. It's just every it's just anytime someone's exacerbated or upset about anything, you can end the statement with and on Pride Month <laughs> and Pride Month. And that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Uh, right now at work, my coworkers and I have a, a bit of a bit going around, and this was started by uh, the most i would say by far the most gender fluid mm-hmm. of my coworkers, and and they were like they were like listen <laughs> i don't remember what we were talking about one of my coworkers, he was just he, we were just shooting the shit and we were all just like saying something and <laughs> and and uh and this other coworker, she was like um you know that's that's pretty that's pretty heterosexual of you to to say that and I was like, "Yeah, if you if you're not gay enough, then we're gonna we're gonna have to call the FBI because it's Pride Month. So you got to gay it up a little bit." And he was like, "Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, uh, and we're like, you're not helping your cause here. <laughs> not helping. So now, anytime anyone says anything, it's like, Ugh, careful. You need to be more gay. So, happy Pride for those that celebrate. We are uh, shout out to the gays and the lesbians and the the transes and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, we are none of those things." So uh, enjoy your parades and all your various activities that you engage in, you know, whatever. Not really me. Not really for me. I've, I've I've seen the pride parades. I see the whole. I get why it would be very fun. It's very hot and humid. Yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not a hot and humid person, so I'm not going to be going outdoors if I can avoid it, particularly in the summer months. That's fair. Yeah. Also, I think usually you're at work during the pride the cincinnati pride parade yeah that is also true that is also true i'm usually i work until 1 p.m so i've gone before it's it's a neat time yeah it's it's a parade found a place with shade to stand and watch it It was great oh that's probably that's probably the way to do it that's probably the way to do it i just miss the day drinking aspect of of all those sorts of celebrations pride fourth of july all of them just the day drinking i can't do that because i'm at work to be fair you don't do much night drinking either 
Tuesdays I do a little bit of drinking. Oh, there you go. But that's uh, not here. No, <laughs> not here. No, I don't, I'm not a home drinker. But that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. Um, again, this is the Duels and Mandorks podcast, which is ostensibly a D and D and Magic the Gathering podcast. Uh, today, today we got some some interesting little little bitties to talk about. Of course, we're gonna give our thoughts about Modern Horizons three at the end. We talk about magic a lot just because it's. There's usually a lot more to talk about. There's always um, more. And we've talked about Modern Horizons 3, I think, like two or three times already on the podcast. So we're just going to Well, gonna that's what happens when spoiler season is a month long. It's a month long, and it's like clearly going to be one of the most powerful and... Um, the most powerful and expensive sets that's going to release all year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you you, you got you to gotta cover it. But we do have some more general general things and watsy's looking to to hire an ai engineer which is interesting we'll get into we'll get into that what that might mean why it might not necessarily be a bad thing either uh cynthia williams former cynthia will she ruin watsy yes asterisk she can't anymore mm-hmm. former president of wizards of the coast got a new job as the president of funco yeah so that's a little that's a little fucky. And uh, Paramount Plus has dropped the live action D and D show from its slate. It will no longer be put on Paramount Plus. Paramount Plus, of course, is the streaming platform where you can currently watch Dungeons and Dragons: Honor Among Thieves. And they had a contract, or they they were they were shipping a script to do a live action show. We've talked about this previously on the podcast, but they are no longer. But it's not necessarily dead yet. So we're gonna we're gonna get into all of that, of course. But first, we're going to go over. The upcoming releases for D and D and Magic: The Gathering, as Sam does every single podcast. Yes, uh, and we're getting close to the end of the 2014 Fifth Edition revision outputs. Uh, but before that, the making of original D and D, not an adventure, but a little history book uh, that'll be available here in about a week and a half on June 18th, if you're listening live. Sure. Uh, next, the final for the 2014 edition will be the Quest from the Infinite Staircase. Uh, that will be available at D&D Beyond and the local game stores on July 9th, with the full release on July 16th. That'll, the anthology book. That'll be the anthology book for this year. Yeah. Uh, six, antho- six stories, chunky. Very chunky. Yeah. Because normally those anthology books are like 20 to 30, like little mini adventures or mm-hmm. like 15 to 20, like a larger counts. And so the fact that it's only six is like, they're going to be like actual multi-session campaigns yeah. that you can run, which all the anthology books are very good. Probably the best things that are put out every year, unless there's an everything put out that year. Yes. And of everything. And of everything. Speaking of everything. Oh boy. We're moving on to one D&D or the 2024 uh, revision of uh fifth edition the player's handbook will come out on september 17th of this year with the dungeon master's guide on november 12th and then the monster manual will be coming out on february 18th of 2025 Uh, we have seen a lot of art starting to come out Mm -hmm. for that we have talked in previous podcasts about uh what we're going to see in the player's handbook and they're supposed to do another fireside chat here soon about a deep with a deep dive into that handbook knowing our luck and how the timing of our podcast works out. Oh my god! <laughs> Sorry, wrong are you me. dying? Yes. Good. And the timing, <laughs> and the timing of our podcast. Uh, this is we're recording this on a Tuesday. It's going to go up onto the Patreon. We have a Patreon. We'll get into that spiel in a bit. Uh, it'll go up for patrons tomorrow, which is Wednesday, and then free feeds on Monday. It's probably going to go live on like Thursday, yeah, or like or like Wednesday at like two p.m. And just be like shadow dropped. And it's like, okay, well, I, we just posted the podcast. So thank you. That That's wonderful. We'll wait two weeks to talk about it, I guess. Yeah. But moving on to Magic the Gathering, Modern Horizons 3. Uh, the pre-release is this coming Friday, June 7th. Uh, full release will be next week, June 14th. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be doing this Friday, we'll be doing pack openings. And we'll do a limited environment uh, format on next Monday's Monday Night Magic. Yeah. Uh, then in July, we get the Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond uh, Beyond Booster pack set. Maybe maybe get the starter decks. Maybe. maybe if you like Assassin's Creed, maybe get the starter decks. And that's probably all you should purchase. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bloomboro will be coming out with its pre-release on July 26th with full release on August 2nd, the weekend of Gen Con. Yes. Uh, if you go to Gen Con, there are currently two... 
uh, commander events that you can partake in that are the Bloomborough Precon Commander battles. So basically they take all of the commander decks for Bloomborough and they set them in a pod and then everybody grabs one and then you play them. So we're still in discussion about whether or not we're going to do that because it's $60, which is more than the price of a pre-con. But you also get prize tickets, and it's also at Gen Con, so you get to play them Mm -hmm. and play against people. Uh, We'll see. I will say last year when we did the... We did Commander Masters and Lord of the Rings. They had yeah, both the, of them as pre-con events. The Lord of the Rings was actually a lot of fun to do. Lord um, of the Rings was very fun. That was those those decks are very balanced against each other. Yeah, especially and then we when we you and I sat down against each other with two two other kids. Mm-hmm. Um, we're we're old compared to them. They're like twenty. I mean, we were twenty eight then. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but I just remember that was that was a lot of fun actually. That was a fun. That was fun. Those those pre-con pods are are. Very, they're very enjoyable at Gen Con. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of sad that they're only doing the Bloomboro ones, and we're not getting Modern Horizons three ones, which I kind of understand. Yeah. But last year at Gen Con, Commander Masters was releasing around the time of Gen Con, so they had Commander Master precons as well. I imagine Modern Horizons three is coming out a little bit too soon. For yeah. Them to guarantee the stock to do them because last year they the the. Lord of the Rings released much closer, yeah. due to the fact that they were the universes beyond set for the mm-hmm. year, and uh, it was. I'm I'm confident that it was printed much more heavily. Yeah, oh, well. absolutely. Um, but finally, to round out this year for uh, Magic: The Gathering, we will have in Q4 Duskmorn, House of Horrors, this kind of slasher flick, mega horror house, uh, House of Horror plane. Mm-hmm. I saw um, I saw a tweet, and I can't remember the specific card, but the Future Sight set. Okay. Do you remember that? Do you uh, know of that set? I'm, I'm, I'm aware of Future Year, Sight. Years ago. And one of the cards that... I can't oh, I can't remember the fact. It was a black card. It was one in a black. And then it it was a whole thing. And people were like, oh, is Duskmorn going to be where we get this from? Because it was like a demon lady. And she had like all these like horrifying like massacred beings behind her and stuff mm. in the art. And they're like, oh, this might be where she actually comes from. And I think that's a, that would be a cool thing for them to do. I don't, I don't really pay that close attention. So I don't know if like some of the cards we talk about or recognize or know from any of these sets are versions of future site cards. Fair. But I think that would be a cool thing to do. There's a card from Innistrad um, from, I think it's Crimson Vow. It's a white, it's one white, one black, or it's, it's a, it's an Orzhov uh human assassin and it's just it's this dude who has a like cow mask on and a bloody apron and a machete mm-hmm. and i'm mm-hmm. like i kind of expect to see more of that sort of thing in there too absolutely i'm off i'm that's much more your vibe than it is my vibe per se who are whore yes oh honestly no i thought you were calling me a whore do you want to be called a whore does that make you feel good I'm not playing. I mean, I'm more of a. I'm, I'm more of a. Stop this line right now. I'm more of a slut man than a than a whore man myself. But I, I do like I I like weird, not necessarily horror. I thought you were gonna say you like being called a slut. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I prefer like so like uh, like paranormal, um, uncanny valley more sort of than oh, actual the, horror. I hate uncanny valley shit. Like like uh, control and. Uh, Alan Wake, mm. like those are more weird, uncanny valley, supernatural things uh, but, than they are. That's why I, I was. I feel like I was always a little creeped out by things like Attack on Titan because the Titans mm. are like kind of close to anime humans, but that's not true. really anime humans. So they're the like, Attack on Titan. That would be pretty fucking cool. That'd be cool. That'd be really cool. Anyway, also there's Daggerheart. Um. <laughs> Dagger Hearts on their version 1.4.1 mm-hmm. from like two or three weeks ago. I'm pretty sure they just put out another uh, one shot too. They did. Yeah, they did. They did do another Dagger Heart one shot, which is pretty cool. They're very they're pushing that one pretty hard, which makes, makes sense. sense. It was immediately sold out at Gen Con. Like the moment you could get events, the all of the Dagger Heart events were sold out immediately. Um, before we get into the news of the day, of course, starting with the AI job posting for Wizards of the Coast and what that might mean, uh, this show, the Duels of Androids podcast, is supported by you over at patreon.com slash the dungeon bros. We also, it's a, 
it's a facsimile for all of our all of our shit but if you go there you can get the podcast early and ad free uh, the following day from when we record it otherwise it will go up to free feeds on the following monday so we record on tuesdays post them on wednesdays and then goes to the free feeds on the following monday you can get them early and ad free on patreon you can also join the patreon for free you can join for free and if you do so, you can then get access to our Patreon feed where we post the podcast questions thread where we answer questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience at the end of the show. And uh, I would like to kind of sprinkle them in a little bit like during the show where it makes sense. You know, sure. someone asking about someone asking about AI generated job posting, mm-hmm. the job for AI at Wizards. And it's like, okay, well, we could ask that during during said that story during that segment so please go check those out and if you want to listen on your podcast service of choice you can get it, you can get the rss feed from patreon and plug it into whatever podcast service you want and you can also get us on podcast services around the globe as part of your fee- free feeds and the video podcast on youtube as well yeah there we appreciate a like a share a subscribe and a just subscribe. leave us on on mute in the background leave you leave Turn it, open up the podcast playlist, Mm -hmm. click play, walk away for six days. Yeah. That would help us out a lot. Anyway, that's a joke, but also. I mean, do do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. But But if you love us. Just watch the episodes regularly. Before we get back to the rest of this podcast clip from the Duels and Mandorks podcast, we want to thank our sponsor, ProxyForge. ProxyForge creates high quality Magic the Gathering proxies for you to use in your commander decks and really anywhere you want. You can get custom Magic the Gathering packs that include CEDH staples as well as monocolor commander staples, cycles of expensive cards like tutors and the swords. You can also get upgrade packs for commander precons that include 10 cards to soup up your favorite precon. If all you want is a very simple mana base, you can get any of the cycles of lands as well as lands organized by color pairing. And that's not to say anything about the custom art soul rings you can acquire as well as the plethora of singles available to you. Use the link in the description below to help us out and check out Proxy Forge to help bling out your board state. Anyway, uh, so AI art, huh? Yeah. Or uh, AI, AI stuff, huh? So Wizards of the Coast has had a lot of issues with AI art in the last year, year and a half, mm-hmm. uh, particularly surrounding Magic the Gathering, though there has been some claims that have drifted into D&D, some more founded than others when they did the uh, the Giants book. Yeah, Big B presents Glory of Giants. Some of the art slipped through mm-hmm. and... Uh, yeah, like you said, with Magic the Gathering, it's been a lot of the uh, advertisements on Twitter a lot of that twi- have gotten heat. Yes, and there's been some claims for card arts as well. Those are a bit more unfounded. That seems to be more of a plagiarism field. Everything's really great. Anyway, <laughs> Wizards of the Coast has responded after tabletop enthusiasts discovered a job posting related to generative AI on their webpage. Enthusiasts are dismayed and outraged expressing their dismay and outrage over a job listing for quote principal ai engineer that was posted earlier in may the post asked for quote proven experiences with ai slash ml systems in at least one of the following areas simulation asset creation and generative content and also states that the ai engineer would be responsible for designing building and deploying systems quote for intelligent generation of text dialogue audio art assets npc behaviors and real-time bot frameworks a lot of people assumed very quickly that wizards of the coast was exploring ai development in their core tabletop games specifically towards what we would assume would be their virtual tabletop platform mm-hmm. that they're instituting into D D beyond uh this article we are reading is from comicbook.com they reached out for comment from wizards and they were told quote Our stance on AI hasn't changed. This job description is for a role for future video game projects. You can reference our AI FAQ here, and then they link a previous FAQ that we have talked about previously after their various AI scandals they've had recently. Of course, they have started several game studios in the past five years and are developing a numerous number of AAA games. And of course, they have had popularity recently with Baldur's Gate 3. When it comes to AI stuff, there's good AI, and then there's bad AI. Uh, Something like a, something like a, a chat GPT is a fine AI. Sure. Nothing, nothing particularly wrong with it, as long as you're not trying to get it to write you, like, stories, because it's probably just going to be bad. Um, 
what a lot of people are upset with is the use of AI generated art. Yes. Specifically, because those bots need to be trained on something. AI models need to have an input that it can analyze and scan in some way and then be able to basically regurgitate the cumulative knowledge that it compiles. Mm -hmm. um, and there's certain ways that you can go about this ethically as well. For example, with Adobe, one of the most popular softwares in the world, Adobe Photoshop. It's for editing pictures. They have a generative fill feature mm -hmm. in Adobe Photoshop now, and that AI has been trained on art assets that they have created themselves as well as commissioned from other people and paid for the licensing for. So their AI model is specifically trained on that pool of assets. And so when you are generative filling in Photoshop, mm -hmm. that is covered legally and is protected. And the art is specifically designed to be used within that context. Uh, in, the, in the case of this job posting, uh, principal AI engineer. So this is someone that's going to be developing AI use cases for their products. Mm -hmm. And as they claim specifically video games, which is already happening in the industry yeah. and very, very inevitable. Um, all, a lot of this stuff is even things that have existed for a while in terms of like simulation, NPC behavior, that kind of stuff. Already very common. Yeah. the video game industry um what i am i'm honestly not nearly as concerned about this as most of the people that are talking about it right now yeah i mean it's obviously a new uh, anytime anything new is coming out it's going to be it's going to cause rage outrage um i once heard a quote i don't remember it's not no no it's not like a high stature quote it's just anything that happens before you were 10 has all is the way all things have always been mm -hmm. anything that happens between your 10 and 25 is new and innovative anything that happens after that is the end of the world yeah um I mean, we've been talking for a long time and and yeah we, it was only a matter of time before something like this was coming to you know coming to come to Watsi. We, we I think we called that like a year ago when we first started really talking about this a lot. Absolutely, is that the AI? I mean, it's very it's a very helpful tool, mm. and of course, it's not an end all be all sort of job taker. Absolutely, yeah. It's developing a new job for somebody. Is it taking away from somebody else? Yeah, some some Could. job is probably going to start losing responsibilities and maybe eventually get folded into folded something into else. Some. And someone will get laid off. But we will, as we go on, we'll probably need more AI generative en engineers. Absolutely. Uh, even even I work I work for a media corporation, and they're pushing us to use AI in a lot of our daily tasks. And mm -hmm. the job that I do, that's not really possible because mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not in a write an email, make a spreadsheet kind of job. Yeah. Uh, but they're really pushing to use AI chatbots and AI generation to aid work mm -hmm. in um, communications and, yeah. and, and, and preparation of like communicative content, like spreadsheets or slideshows and that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I work for IT and uh, we've definitely had, uh, it was a little more, it was a little more talked about before my company kind of got mold uh, in, in a, in a buyout, but there were people who were very, who are like, look at this AI that I can tell it what I want it to do, and then it'll generate me a bunch of, it'll, so many lines of code that I don't have to now do. Yeah. Um, it's just very interesting to, yeah, to see these two different sides of it, where it's people like us who are like, ah, oh, we're, you know, we're people, developers love this because they have to do less work. Or on the other hand, yeah, when it comes to creative, the creative side of things, which obviously people who are invested in Wizards of the Coast products are very also interested in. Absolutely. I mean, it's a very it's a very creative industry, tabletop RPGs and, mm -hmm. and TCGs. Wizards has their hand in both of them, obviously. Um, but one of the big one of the big to the along those lines, one of the big uh, tweets that I see going around is a screenshot that's shared by like everyone that's mm -hmm. talking about this is someone saying, I don't want AI to be doing my art and my creative work so that I can do, I want, sorry, I want AI to be doing my 
laundry and dishes so mm-hmm. that I can do art and creative things. And I do, instead of doing art and creative things so, so I, can I can do, do my laundry. laundry and my dishes. That's fair. You know? So I, I completely agree. And I think that is something that's going to be a discussion going forward and possibly even like a future marketing point mm-hmm. for creative works, be they video games or uh, tabletop RPGs or minis or any anything really of like this is not made with any AI. This is all mm-hmm. human made stuff. Um, and that would be an opportunity for a lot of people. But obviously the 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 business pros of ai are going to end up way, outweighing the cons mm-hmm. in that in that regard so to that end what are some of the use cases that you would see with ai that would be applicable for watsi in magic in dnd in whatever they've got their hands in that would be both ethical uh more publicly acceptable and just kind of generally useful for both them and the industry as a whole. I think one of the first big ones that pops to my mind is uh, simulated gameplay mm-hmm. for things like Magic the Gathering when they get, you know, they make all the cards and then they pu- you know, they plug it into an AI and they say, "Okay, go ahead and take all these mechanics and play 10,000 games. Mm-hmm. Tell me which cards are broken. Tell me which cards are just don't make sense um what car and, and it, it doesn't even have to tell you that it can no. create a spreadsheet of like if i want to win games i built this deck like i pulled these cards together mm-hmm. from this set and these were the cards that i was cast that was being cast the most to cause a win yeah and and that could be used obviously if you're if you're a consumer who were to look at that you might be like oh it's going to you know take away from the idea of deck building or whatever but as watsy you can use that and be like oh okay you know they they strive a lot in certain cases in D in particular more than mtg to be to make it so that there are no right choices no that's not right no must-have choices yes to always try and keep things you know balanced or interesting to make sure people have that option of of showing their creativity through the the built product Mm -hmm. and it ultimately is just another level of qa Mm -hmm. that's going to help them in their design process yeah um their comments are indicating that they're using it specifically in the context of video games uh which when it comes when it comes down to it the core video game op op um for the core video game products, yeah. sorry, that they have right now that they're working on in house, because obviously they're licensing out D and D, right? They license Magic, uh, are Magic: The Gathering Arena, mm-hmm. uh, to a lesser extent Magic Online, but uh, their their virtual tabletop that they're working on yeah. for one D and D. So in the context of Magic Arena, it's going to make the bots better. Mm-hmm. It has the opportunity to make the bots better. It also has the opportunity to be more creative and more intricate with the arena exclusive abilities yes Uh, because there are certain abilities for cards they're called alchemy cards that are exclusive to magic the gathering arenas and those cards have mechanics and keywords on them that you cannot replicate in paper because they require a digital computer and randomization and all of that kind of like, stuff s- like seek when you when you seek something you just pull it out of the deck randomly which you couldn't do that yourself because it still it requires you to search the deck mm-hmm. so if you but they are like okay with seek you pull it out and then you don't have to you don't the rest is still stable and another one is uh you cast like a monocolor card and then you can uh, augment it with an with another color mm-hmm. and so there can be like five different iterations of a single card based on what uh, extra color is being dumped into it yeah and you can't you can't have five sides of a physical card that'd be be wild that would be awesome and i would love it but it's not something that you can do and so those kinds of mechanics can get a bit more intricate and they can be more designed around Mm -hmm. and make arena its own platform that can play and feel separate from regular magic um and then for D D. Obviously, the virtual tabletop is going to be a core product that they have. And they've talked a lot about AI Dungeon Masters. Yeah. And that is a very controversial thing. At the end of the day, there are people that do not want to run a game. Mm -hmm. And they just want to play in a game. 
And there's some people that really struggle with finding people to play with and someone to run their game. And so if you can find two, three people that are willing to play, but no one knows how or is willing to run the game, popping in a good AI dungeon master can be enough to bridge that gap. Because you don't necessarily, like, there are certain things that you need, that you really need, like, a person to oh, do. Yeah. Like, deeper storytelling, more more um, NPC interaction-based campaigns. Uh, something a Romancing more... your friends. Exactly. Well, the friend's not necessarily an NPC. I mean, what if you really want to romance your friend that's Dungeon Master? Oh. Oh. Also, yes. <laughs> there's already people that have AI girlfriends. Yeah, that's true. They, they, there's, the apps are all over the fucking place, and the ads are inescapable. Well, yeah. It's infuriating. But the AI Dungeon Master is going to be really, really good for bridging the gap for combat, for rules adjudicating... Mm -hmm. um for handling and giving roles based on player actions and it's just going to have to come down to how well it interprets what text or audio input is going to be given from the players uh to actually run and then the other side of that is as a dungeon master if you're using the virtual tabletop as a dungeon master mm -hmm. uh, they're already working on it in unreal engine so they're making it 3d they're adding miniatures Let's say you want to run a really complex board state. Yeah. And it's like, you can type in, I want these 14 goblins to strategically try and surround the party and, and get them. Mm -hmm. And then the AI can handle the goblins and then you can handle the chief or like a couple of key NPCs or like the dragon and it's various uh, like little fire newts and shit and little minions and stuff and you can let the AI handle the minions or you can help it to speed up the pace of play by dealing with the rolling and the damaging mm -hmm. aspect of it by itself and that kind of stuff um, whether or not people are going to go for any of that is the big question mark I think it's obviously going to be one of those things that evolves over time um, I mean, yeah, right now, if, if there was, if there was that exact option of like, okay, it, it's very hard for, as a dungeon master, as we are, we have both played that role many a time, uh, to be like, all right, I have, I want to have a, either a, a, a complicated or even just a, like, I want to balance the level of difficulty that my party is going to face. Like mm -hmm. not every part now, you know, not every fight needs to be a 10 out of 10 difficulty, um, that's th something I would probably use right now if you offered it to me like, all right, I can just I can say that I want a medium encounter. We're using these things, and okay, you're gonna you you AI. Or we should give it a name. Um, Chat D and D. Gary, Gary, like Gary's mod, like Gygax, but yeah, Gary Gygax's mod. Uh, Gy Gygax AI. Gag perfect. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, Gygax AI. Here are. Uh, here are yeah, like you said, a dozen a dozen goblins. Make it so that this is a medium encounter, and the goblins are medium smart. Mm -hmm. um, that way, it doesn't look like I'm pulling any of my punches. That way, it doesn't look like I'm trying. You know, I don't have to think about all their individual attack rolls. I think that'd be pretty cool. I think I, the biggest advantage for D and D specifically, I think, is going to be just improving the pace of play. Yeah, because combats are where sessions get drugged down a lot. Yeah. Um, especially depending on your DM. Mm -hmm. So any sort of aid will help a lot with that. And I believe there's already a fair number of AI generative tools out there for Dungeon Masters that sure. are already growing in popularity. I mean, between map building, dungeon building, mm -hmm. uh, combat and counter building, mm -hmm. um, story building. Hopefully people calm the fuck down a little bit, as per usual. <laughs> we all want people to just chill out in general. Do you have anything else you would like to say about uh, the principal AI engineer that they're looking for over at WotC? Maybe I'll go apply. I probably won't get the job. Because that is it's, not it's, my that is not my area of expertise. In the slightest. And you never know, it might it might it might be remote. It might pay well. Probably remote. Hopefully remote. <laughs> they're selling their offices. Oh yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. All right, moving on. We're going to stay in the realm of D&D &D for now, specifically live-action adaptations of D&D. &D. We previously talked about a live-action Dungeons & Dragons series that was being worked on by Paramount+, Plus, but it is no more. 
Paramount Plus went to Watsy and said, no, nah, no, nah, not today. Not today. We're not doing it today, bud. Done. Put the axe to it. But it's not dead in the water. Paramount Plus has opted not to proceed with its live action series based on Hasbro's widely popular Dungeons & Dragons fantasy role-playing franchise. The move comes almost a year and a half after Paramount stream after the Paramount streamer in January 2023 gave the project an eight-episode straight-to-series order. At the time, it was a co-production between Hasbro owned E1 production studio, which had developed the series and Paramount Pictures. Now shepherded by Hasbro's in-house division, Hasbro Entertainment, following E1's December 2023 sale to Lionsgate, the project will undergo a creative update before being taken out to other potential buyers, both production partners and platforms. These changes will include a new creative team, the version which sold to Paramount Plus, was from creator Rawson Marshall Thurber, who wrote the pilot script and is set to direct, who was set to direct the first episode. He was subsequently joined by Drew Crevelo, who came in on board in April of 2023 as executive producer and showrunner. Hasbro, which retains all rights to the underlying material, remains committed to getting a live action Dungeons and Dragons series off the ground as part of a broader universe, which includes the 2023 feature film uh, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves, as well as a Broadway Dungeons and Dragons show, The 20 Sided Tavern, which is currently playing. Like Hasbro's entertainment operations, Paramount also has been in a transition with multiple potential buyers circling the company around the 102-year-old movie studio of the same name. So things are a little bit in flux with Mm -hmm. both of the organizations. It's not entirely surprising. If you want to watch Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves, you can see it currently on Paramount+. Plus. They're the current streamer. But we were... We were concerned when they closed E1, what the ramifications of that yeah. would be back when it happened. I mean, we were talking about, they, they were looking, they were pending that sale since April of last year. Um, it seems like a lot longer than December that it actually got sold. Mm-hmm. But I I don't think that they'll they'll have too much trouble finding somebody else to buy it. Amazon is buying up all these projects these yeah. days between, you know, uh, produced Critical Role um Oh, what did Legend they, of Vox Machina. Legend of Vox, thank you. Legend of Vox Machina. It's done the Fallout series recently. It's paid a massive amount of money for Rings of Power. Yes. Amazon's drowning in money. Um, I'm interested in what this original show was going to be. Mm-hmm. If it was going to have the same kind of tone as Honor Among Thieves, or if it was going to take a bit more of a serious tone, maybe center around some popular characters that we already know from D&D, as opposed to creating new ones like they did for the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, like a, a, Baldur's, a Baldur's Gate uh, a Baldur's Gate series featuring some of the characters you would recognize. Maybe uh, maybe a Dridst de Erden appearance Drids be pretty cool just would be cool so they're bringing it in house watsy's gonna be shopping it around mm-hmm. i don't know how much you know about the hollywood studio structure there's a lot of potential buyers here. yeah do you think that hasbro is going to be able to hold up and create a product on their own well i mean obviously they're going to be partnering right, right so right. thankfully they're going to have the help but they brought all of the all of the work in house in a lot of ways is that a more concerning thing, or do you think that's going to ensure that uh, it's a bit more faithful to the source material? I think one thing we've learned about Watsi over the past, well, how long have we been, be, we've been doing this podcast? Well, um, 68 episodes, once every other week, is 30, or God, no, 136 weeks. So, so two and a half years. Two and a half years now. I think we've learned a lot about Wizards of the Coast in that time and their faithfulness to their own works is not necessarily something that has been prioritized for a, for a, a long for a most of it. Mm-hmm. Um and the fact that Wizards of the, Co- of the Coast and Hasbro have both been in major flux these past couple of months it is a little a little concerning of what kind of thing they are going to create themselves. Mm-hmm. Now, along those lines, uh, the D and D movie was better than it had any right to be. The D and D movie was pretty great. It was pretty good. It was pretty dang good. 
Um, as I think D and D as a property, when it comes to adaptations for film and whatever screen you're watching, mm-hmm. I think the television format is just a format that works a lot better for the kind of storytelling that you would get out of D and D. Yeah, if they decide to go with a more, if they that that more classic, because that was one thing that D and D had. Honor Among Thieves really did well was that it didn't necessarily say, hey, these are the characters of people who are role playing. Um, it did this. This is the world. And yeah, the characters are a little goofy, but that's because they are D&D characters. Mm-hmm. I think that, yeah, if we kept along those ideas of either they're having these shorter little adventures that are that are very episodic because they're a D&D session or or uh, it, if they kept to that, that makes perfect sense to me. I I would go the opposite direction because I want to D and D for what people watch it for has changed a lot in the last decade with Critical Role, with Roll Twenty, with all of these things. People like more deeper storytelling in a lot of ways, and D and D Honor Among Thieves a great representation of the feel of D and D with the goofiness, with the adventure, with the spectacle, with mm-hmm. all of that kind of stuff. I think if we're going to do it in a series, like you can have those elements, but you can't. But in a lot of ways, I think it would not be beneficial to center it around those elements either. Um, they're some of the most popular streaming shows that have happened right now. Basically, none of them are comedies except for like some animated ones. Sure. So I think having your your D and D elements, but I wanna I wanna see them try and tackle a little bit more of a, a serious tone and do like some more serious fantasy storytelling. And ideally I think it would be more fun to include fantasy characters in the universe of D D that we are more familiar with. True. Um whether or not they are successful here and the time horizon that we are now looking at, because they basically reset the timeline. Yeah. In terms of when this will be coming out. So it's a whole thing. Fuck you, Paramount Plus. <laughs> <laughs> how dare how dare you think you're a big enough platform to have your own streaming services all out? You ever looked oh. at the price of Paramount Plus? It's like twenty bucks a month. That's still Nothing. way too much. That's still way too much. Oh, absolutely. We it's I thought about I was I was the other day I was like I was thinking about a show I'm like oh that show originally aired on NBC I don't even remember what show it is now but I was like that show aired on NBC like uh, let me go check the scene no definitely not I yeah. don't care about that show enough to <laughs> to go pay twenty bucks streaming platforms are starting to bundle together now the streaming is starting to collapse under its own weight right now so it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out in terms of like the Hollywood structure mm-hmm. and and the production of these sorts of things and if quality is going to go down or if they're going to have to be more frugal perhaps perhaps go back to some some nice methods from early 2000s films mid 2000s films when the CG looked really good because it was half practical. <laughs> I digress. Do you have uh, anything else you want to say about the live action show? Uh, no. I'm good on the live action show. All right. Last thing before we get into our Modern Horizons 3 pre-release final thoughts. Mm-hmm. Cynthia, will she ruin Watsy? No, but almost. It's close. She got she got dangerously close. She got dangerous, dangerously close. And was kind of given the old boot, given the axe, sent packing immediately into the offices of Funko. Yeah. So Funko... Funko, the creator of the Funko Pop, the very popular merchandise collectible with probably millions of various properties yeah. <laughs> licensed through them, have taken uh, Cynthia Williams, former president of Wizards of the Coast, as their new president. The news was announced as part of the company's quarter one earnings report. Williams officially starts on May 20th. She started on May 20th. And she will leverage experience that she's had overseeing divisions of Hasbro, Microsoft, and Amazon to try and steer Funko back towards growth and profitability. In full transparency, which is rare, (laughs) which is very rare, Funko has revealed that Williams will have a starting annual base salary of $1 million and will be eligible for performance-based bonuses up to 200% of this figure. So... Up to $2 million. 
if it's based on performance, she might be making a little bit less than a million dollars. Is all I'm going to say. <laughs> now, has has Wizards of the Coast been profitable? Yes. Yes. Has she shepherded in an era of of sadness and distress and poor product and oversaturation? Also, yes. Not to mention the uh, the the poor community uh, relations and. Um, yeah, mostly the poor community relations that have mm-hmm. increased over her time as a as the prez. Yeah. So with Funko, I'm, if you're in America, you probably are familiar with Funko Pops in yeah. a lot of ways. Very frustratingly so for most people. Uh, highly collectible by some. They're the beanie babies of this generation. Yep. Like I, I even even the a lot of the ones that are like into them and collect a lot of them everyone kind of sees the writing on the wall with these things like they're a lot of people see them as an investment they're just a silly toy and people buy them because they got characters they like yeah i mean that's one of the things it's like when you when you create something to be a collectible very rarely does it hold the collectibles value absolutely absolutely and their entire business model is built around the the properties that they are licensing mm-hmm and whether or not those products are going to be popular enough to continue to sustain the model. And the longer that the company exists, the harder and more expensive it's going to be to do those two things. You can only release so many Walking Dead things before The Walking Dead is no longer relevant. You can only release so many Dragon Ball Z figures until... All the Dragon Ball Z fans are more than satiated with their products and are not willing to buy them anymore. You can only sell so many Funko Pops until people look at their wall of dozens of them and have that moment of, oh, I don't want this anymore. Yeah. And their earnings have shown they're they're fairly steadily declining. So I don't know if Cynthia Williams is the person I would tap to solve that problem. But uh, this will probably be the last we need to say anything about her for a while, which is nice. Well, yeah. I mean, she's on. She's your problem now, Funko yeah. fandom. You can have. You can have her. All yours. Um, that being said, I do own several Funko pops. You, yeah, they I, sit on our on our uh, in our stairwell down to the basement. Yes, that we have a little we have a little ledge in, next to the stairwell that I have them stacked up on on top of each other. I have some. I have one Lord of the Rings one. I've got a lot of Kingdom Hearts ones and some Iron Men as well. I think you also have a Groot as well. I do. Uh, honestly, half of them are gifts. <laughs> <laughs> so. Although I mean, absolutely, people are like, "Oh, I know that you like that thing." And 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 here's it's a very one very easy gift. And I walked into um uh uh FYE. Oh God, FYE. Do people go to malls still? Still mall open in 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 uh, here in Cincinnati in Norwood. There's also one in Florence, Kentucky, which is a little bit south of Cincinnati. So everything around the malls, of course, are being knocked down. Mm-hmm. They're well, <laughs> malls are starting to slowly become strip malls because malls needed large parking lots mm, to true. accommodate all of the people going there. And now fewer people are going to the mall in the first place. And as such, they need to better use that space. So they're turn so like on the outskirts of the parking lots, they're putting like fucking pf changs mm-hmm. and and a, a fucking um generic italian restaurant buca de beppo buca de beppo thank you that was literally exactly the one i was, I was like because you, you ate there recently <laughs> yes <laughs> yes i did <laughs> it was pretty good <laughs> but like they're they're starting to like form little pockets of things on the outsides of these malls and so like all the space is being used more efficiently that's a whole it's a whole thing i've got nothing to say i'm not buying pop uh, funko pops anymore Lastly, I've never a Pop. you've never bought a Funko I've Pop. I've never bought a Funko Pop. Never oh. owned one. I get. I, get I thought they were dumb. They are very decidedly <laughs> even. But what can I say? Hmm. What can I say? I will. I believe my sister and brother-in-law had uh, a Funko Pop cake toppers for their wedding. Oh, one was Iron Man, and one was Black Widow, which they pasted a white dress on. Okay, moving on. That one, that one, I'm, 
That one upset me. That one actually genuinely upset me. So, moving on, uh, we're going to talk about modern. Do you have anything else you want to say about about Funko? Okay, cool. I'm. I I I felt the energy drain from me (laughs) with that. I'm. When did they get married? What year? That was I was a. I think I was a senior in college, so I was twenty. 16 that's that's like the beginning summer of 2016 that, that was okay that if you had said something like 2013 2014 i would have been like okay fair by 2016 2017 it's like it's already on the decline it's already kind of like all right we get it you know yeah. probably got them cheap then. <laughs> probably probably anyway we're moving on to modern horizons 3 i'm i'm done i'm done with the fun cover. we're moving on to our wrap-up of, of modern horizons 3 pre pre uh spoiler season yeah post spoiler post season. spoiler season pre pre-release season. pre pre-release so in a couple of days uh if you're watching this on the free feeds this will have already happened but the pre-release weekend is upon us is upon us we'll be getting our pre-release kits on friday we're gonna live stream opening them mm-hmm. which will be pretty fun and then on the monday night magic that we have every week we're gonna make a little pre-release decks we're gonna so play limited. them do a little bit of limited, but we now have all of the deck lists for the pr- Commander Precons. We have all of the cards revealed for the set. So we're going to go over some of the last ones that have been revealed, some ones that stand out to us, and just kind of give our final thoughts on the set as a whole and what we are excited for. I'm going to start with, uh, in the Commander Precons, we're getting a new enchantment called Copy Land. If you are familiar with Copy Artifact... Or it, Copy Enchantment. Or Copy Enchantment. Uh, it's those, except... it copies a land so it's two and a blue for an enchantment that says you may have copy land enter the battlefield as a copy of any land on the battlefield except it is an enchantment in addition to its other types so it will die to enchantment based removal Mm -hmm. much like the copy artifact will die to enchantment based removal as well artifact based removal and and enchantment also true it retains the enchantment type yes but the, a three mana a three mana copy land with the amount of crazy lands that are going around this is something that is going to go into um i i'm between copy land which i don't oh ooh, are the commander precons for modern horizons three are those cards going to be legal in modern uh uh ooh. if they would have if they have the commander set symbol no okay Okay, so Copyland will not be legal in Modern. So my my beloved Dark Depths Thespian Stage Copyland combo is is no more. It How's is. that? Because if you copy if you copy the Dark Depths, uh, it enters mm-hmm. with or may have entered the battlefield as a so ooh, it would enter the battlefield. It would enter the battlefield as a as, copy of that as a Dark Depths. Yes, so it would have the counters and it would ooh because that's an would, enter the battlefield. Yeah, ability. okay, okay, okay. That doesn't combo how I thought it would, and one of them would die to the legend rule, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, copy land's going to combo with a ton of things. It's going to be super powerful. It's going to be effectively a three mana ramp spell in mm-hmm. blue, uh, and you'll be able to ramp to the best land in play at the time. Yeah, you could have you could have a second command tower. You could steal, um, you could steal a Nykthos. You could steal a, a Yavimaya, a Cradle. Like, a, there's a ton of super powerful non basic lands that this yeah. thing will be able to copy. And we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of different sorts of ooh. So after Ma, after March of the Machines, mm. they made the update to the rule that if you create a token of something that's double sided, it gets both sides of the token. Yes. So if you copy let's say one of the lands that on the other side has a god uh, an o'hare oh 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 i don't like that <laughs> i don't like that one bit that's that's devilish and i there have been i there have been so many interesting things that can happen now that they they made that update yeah that was a big that was a big one because they literally had to change the rules of magic to accommodate those tokens because tokens wouldn't previously be able to flip over Mm -hmm. to something else until they created the incubator token for that set um yeah that's fucky love it that's fucky love it uh do you want to talk about your sure Uh, boy we have the benthic anomaly here this uh uh, so a bunch of a bunch of the very popular uh actual plays live plays Mm -hmm. gameplay uh series uh have gotten hold of the decks early and have released their videos and so i got to watch the commander at home one where somebody cast this benthic anomaly six and a blue for a eldrazi serpent uh, it's a seven eight with the void 
And when you cast a spell for each opponent, choose a creature that player controls. Not target, choose. Uh, creature, create a token that's a copy of one of those creatures, except it has the power equal to the total power of those creatures and its toughness equal to the total toughness of those creatures, and it's a colorless Eldrazi. That is a that is a block of text. That is a block of text. Uh, but what it comes down to is you now get a copy of one of your p- p- uh, opponent's powerful creatures. So enter the battlefields, any, att- any, any triggers, anything like that. But on top of that, it's likely going to be ginormous because usually somebody at the table also has a ginormous thing. Uh, getting, getting a commander table where someone doesn't have a creature of power six or higher in addition to a powerful effect on a creature that you would like to have. Yeah. In addition to something else that's pretty big, like you're going to have a super powerful ETB static ability, activated ability, any anything mm-hmm. that's going to be attached to a massive creature. Oh yeah. You could you could copy a rog rock and then make it a base like 1010. Yeah. <laughs> Easily. <laughs> you could just grab you could just copy something with four keywords on it and make it huge. 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 Gonna be huge. Um, What I want to talk about, and this one's actually, it would, it's got the fucking commander set symbol. Damn it. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Modern, modern commander horizons. Printing cards not legal and modern. Because this would be another, I really like the dark depths as a, as a combo. The land, the dark depths. So the mutated cultist is a two and a black for a 1-3 Eldrazi Horror with Devoid, making it colorless. It also has Death Touch, but more importantly, when you cast this spell, remove all counters from up to one target permanent or opponent. The next spell you cast this turn costs one less to cast for each counter removed this way. So the 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 plan in its base level is you cast this three mana thing, you then are able to remove some counters from something, and then more probably than not, reduce the cost of your commander, particularly if you were having to recast said commander. Uh, in the context of a Dark Depths situation, uh, which has 10 ice counters on it, you can remove all 10, so you're going to get your 2020 Merit Lage token yep. with Indestructible, which is pretty cool, and... You're now going to be able to cost something that it will cost, or cast something that will cost ten less, like uh, like a Ulamog. Yeah. Or a or a or a. Wow, can you imagine uh, casting a an Ulamog the, for a one mana? Literally, like any of the big Eldrazi. Like I could see if this were legal and modern. It's not legal and modern. I'm so furious. If it were legal and modern, there would be an entire new deck. That would be built around the Mutated Cultists, Dark Depths, Thespian Stage, and like a couple big Eldrazi. Mm-hmm. And that would be the core strategy of the deck, is getting your Mutated Cultist out to wipe your uh, Dark Depths and get your Merit Lage, and then be able to free cast a big Eldrazi. Because even once the Merit Lage comes out, there are ways to come back from that. If you're com- if you're trying to fight against a 2020 Merit Lage and an Eldrazi Titan, yeah. like you're kind of fucked regardless of what you're trying to do. Because the Eldrazi is going to fuck up your board state, fuck up your hand, fuck up whatever you're trying to do. And then you got a 2020 Indestructible Merit League. I'm obsessed with that combo. On top of that, I mean, obviously the the one of the main ideas with this card is probably, since it's in the Commander decks, to play it, remove the energy counters from your opponent, mm-hmm. and then... Or, mm-hmm. or anything, really. Like, you you know, if there's you're, you're going to incidentally be able to probably uh, get a discount of at least three, if not more mana. Yeah, and in the Eldrazi deck... You, you need it. You're going you're gonna to want it. In a pod of all four of these decks, obviously I think the Eldrazi one's the most powerful. Mm-hmm. It has the most versatility. But getting this off and screwing up the energy player's plan, and then being able to cast your Ulalek, your any of the massive Eldrazi spells that are in that deck for a massively reduced cost because if you're removing like eight energy counters from someone you can free cast most of the cards in your deck oh yeah <laughs> right so that's just a little bit ridiculous uh i do i, I do want to double up here and i want to talk about some more of these mdfcs i want to say one last thing on the Ooh. Cult, on the on, on the mutated cre- on cultist the mutated cultist uh the devoid mechanic specifically it says this card has no color. That does not affect the color identity. Correct. So this can only go in a color in a commander deck that includes black. 
Yes. Yes. Those ghosts, those go, the, the color identity goes based off of um, what the pips, pips appear on the card. Either in casting cost or in activated abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, not reminder text, though, with extort. Yep. It's not reminder text. That does not count. Uh, but for the, for the mechanics of, like, base card effects that change a color or only affect a certain color of creature or whatever, yeah. they have no color for those kinds of effects. Uh, I do want to talk about the MDFC Yeah, lands. absolutely. So, a cycle of lands where on the back... It is a single color. You can have it enter untapped if you pay three life. We've seen these before. Mm-hmm. The ones for Modern Horizons 3 are printed at uncommon, yep. which is great. And the one that I'm looking at is the Pinnacle Monk. If you know anything about my decks, I have a Narset the Enlightened Exile deck. Loves prowess. Loves spell slinging. For three and a red, I can get a 2-2 Dijin Monk with prowess. And when it enters the battlefield, I can return a target instant or sorcery card from my graveyard to my hand. So is it overcost for those effects? Yes. It's one mana more than an Archaeomancer. Mm-hmm. For the same power toughness, and it gets prowess, and its backside is a land that you can put onto the battlefield untapped for three life. Yep. Uh, I see that as a complete win. Absolutely. In fact, all of, pretty much all of the MDFCs I see as complete wins. Even the ones that are just tapped dual lands on the backside. Yeah. Like all of them are fantastic. If you pull any of them, you're going to be in a very, very good spot. Do you have any? Do you have any other ones that you want to pick out right now? Uh, no, we can go. We can go on to another. Uh, you want to go on to the other cycle of lands you're very interested in? Ooh, yeah. Well, for for one, there's there's uh, there's okay two. There's so many land cycles Pretty in cool. the cycles of lands. Yes. In in this set, and pretty much all of them are fantastic. <laughs> Uh, Arena of Glory is part of a cycle that is uh, taps for one color of of mana, and it enters untapped if uh, you control a associated basic land type. So the Arena of Glory will enter the battlefield tapped unless you control a mountain. And the green one, which has a channel ability, which is also ridiculously powerful, will enter tapped unless you control a forest mm-hmm. and all of that kind of stuff. But Arena of Glory, it taps for a red. You can also pay a red and tap it to exert it, It'll add two red mana, and if you use that red mana on a creature spell, it will gain haste until the end of turn. So it is a mana neutral activated ability on a land. The cost is it will not untap during your untap step on your next turn, and it is just a haste enabler for any creature that you spend the mana on. It doesn't have to be spent on red mana for a creature. It just has to be spent on mana for the creature. For a very low deck building cost. I think all of these, this cycle of lands that are tapped for one color, they can enter untapped if you control a land of the basic land type. Yeah. And then have another activated ability or a channel ability or whatever. I think the black, ooh, it's not a, is it the, no, the, no, the one I'm thinking of already existed where it, it was a black and tap and then it gives a creature fear. Uh, that one yeah. is so, uh, Sokenzon? Takanuma? Takanuma? I think it's Takanuma. That one already exists. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. The cycle of lands that I think should be included in every three plus color commander precon forever. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I hit the microphone. This is the landscape cycle of lands. These are very similar to the ones we got in New Capenna yes. in some ways, where they entered the battlefield and would sack themselves, and you could search up a basic land of one of the three types. The landscape lands enter the battlefield untapped. They can tap for colorless. You can also tap them to sacrifice them and search your library for a basic one, two, three. So in the case of the bountiful landscape, you can search for a forest, island, or a mountain. For the contaminated one, you could do plains, island, swamp, and it's three land types. Lastly, they all have cycling. Yep. So you can cycle for the three colors. So in the case of the bountiful landscape, green, blue, and red, you can cycle it to discard it and draw a card. Uh, because of the cycling, which is probably why they added the cycling in some way, uh, they can only go in decks that have those colors. Yep. So you can't just load up a cheap pre-con with like a ton of them. However, if you're playing in a limited environment, oh. uh, like we will be next Monday, as long you know, even if you have two of them, two of those colors, or or if you're playing a a, uh, a deck with um, 
three or more colors. Three or more colors, or just a, a two-color deck. Colorless. Colorless, uh, absolutely, in a deck that is very, or in a, a format that has a lot of colorless matters. Um, all those Eldrazi want, need you to have uh, colorless in either their casting cost or maybe an activated ability. Or they need ten of them. Or they need ten of them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, these are super cool. It makes sure that you're not going to feel like you're missing a land drop, mm-hmm. which the, that's one of my biggest problems. And I think we experienced this when we started playing Commander was the big pre-con staples, your Evolving Wilds Myriad Landscape. Yeah. Myriad Landscape enters tapped. It can tap for colors, but it enters tapped. And so you feel like you're missing a land drop. Evolving Wilds can only be tapped to sacrifice and then get a tapped basic into play. Yeah. Which feels like you're missing a land drop. These have the ability to search for a basic of the color type that you choose, and it will enter tapped. But they can also enter untapped, and you can tap them for colorless. And if you draw it late game, you can spend three mana, which is a lot, to cycle them away to get a new card. Mm-hmm. Like these, these, this cycle of 10 lands is so, so good. And it is printed at common. They're pretty much all going to be less than a dollar and it's a cycle that could very easily be put in commander pre-cons across the board where the colors identity fits it's going to feel good it's Mm -hmm. going to feel efficient it's going to be inexpensive it's going to be a casual staple and i am thrilled by that i love all of these abilities i will say it also includes so um Loading Ready Run gets to do a pre-pre-release where they get to do a pre-release the week before the pre-release. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were talking about this on their on their podcast and I was listening. It presents, first off, yes, off, uh, for, for, uh, for pre-con environments, it's a very, very new player friendly. It, it uh, you know, introduces you to three mechanics, basically, right off the top. They're very easy to understand. Mm-hmm. But then when you're, when you get a little uh, higher, then it also still keeps you in that realm of thinking, okay, I played this, but on this turn, is it better to tap me for mana right now? Or can I, or should I go get that? That color fixing. That color fixing. My deck a little bit. Yeah. It. I love cards that l- offer both sorts of it gives you level it, of thought. It gives you options, and all of the options are equally useful in different situations. Yeah. And it's incumbent on you to determine which situation those cards are going to perform the best in, and that makes gameplay interesting. Yes. <laughs> that makes that makes you have to think a little bit, and it's not just a, like a, oh, well, and... I love I love the Neon Dynasty channel lands. Mm-hmm. There's no deck building cost to them. It's like if I need a land, I'll play a land. If I don't need a land, I got a spell in my hand that can't really be countered because it's an activated ability. Yeah, it, it's very low deck building cost. These have very low deck building costs, and they have versatility, and they make you think a little bit. And it's just so good. I love that they're printed at common. I hope, hope, hope. That Gavin Verhey is like, yes, we're putting these in all of the <laughs> fucking three, four, five color precons that we make forever. Yeah. They're they're going to be cheap. They're going to be easy to slap into anything. They're going to be useful in anything. Do it. If not, open Do up it. a bunch. Mu- Do it. Open up a bunch of packs. You're probably going to get like 12 of them. Yeah. So that's the whole thing. Do you have anything else you would like to say about Modern Horizons 3? Um, I'm, I'm excited to open up some cards this weekend there's just so many one not only just good powerful high-end cards but also like the fucking commons are ridiculous the commons are good the uncommons are good like the the landscape lands they're popper legal yeah <laughs> they're yeah. great popper cards they're great popper edh cards like the the uncommon cycles of dual faced lands are ridiculous. You get two color ones, you get mono color ones. Like it's it's all so good and so many of these really good cards are going to be super cheap yeah. because they're going to be so readily accessible. This set is going to be opened up ridiculously. There's going to be so many cards of these in the wild. All the uncom most all of the uncommons and commons I would bet are going to end up under a dollar. Hopefully. Hopefully, except for some crazy top end ones, obviously, like the the Rakdos equipment that is basically just a better in many ways. All that glitters it has two colors. So it's a little bit of a limitation. I get it. It's an equipment. It has an equipment. That one's going to be more. But I will say from watching the 
pre pre release by loading ready run. What I've un what uh, and some things they touched on, at least for the p- limited environment. A lot of sacrifice, mm-hmm. uh, a, a sacrifice for benefit. Very very a uh, lot of through through lines in this set. Also, uh, pay attention to your energy. Yes, because. Not every card that has energy printed on it is necessarily an energy deck card or not exclusively an energy deck card. Like we looked at the Cthodian, Cthodian Nightmare. Mm. Has no energy on it. You can play that in any deck, really. Yeah, because you can use the energy it produces on its own effect. Yeah. And it's basically just like if you happen to be running energy, the effect is better. Yeah. If not, the effect is still pretty good. Uh, also, I want to build a Nadu Winged Wisdom deck as my first Simic deck. First Simic deck? So that'll be that'll be fun. <coughs> Excuse me. That is all we have for Modern Commander Masters Horizons Three. <laughs> we. <laughs> <laughs> what Modern Commander Masters Horizons Three? I gotta hit all the buzzwords. You know, it's the whole thing. So and, and don't worry, it has the Modern Commander Master bu- buzzword price too. It does. It a- it absolutely does. But we're going to end this episode of the Duels of Mandorks podcast, as we always do, by going to both our Patreon, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros, as well as the TikTok live chat, as we record the as we record the podcast live on TikTok every other Tuesday, for questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the audience. We give preferential treatment to our patrons. You can join the Patreon for free for and free. ask questions for free and ask questions for free for free and you can join uh as a paid member and you can get early ad free access to the podcast you can get your name right at the end of the show all that kind of stuff based on the tier that you so desire from the patreon we got brandon who wants uh some thoughts on eldrazi are they too powerful and he says do we leave if someone pulls that deck out no do we get upset if someone pulls that deck out? We have one friend who plays a, a souped-up Eldrazi precon from Commander Masters. I don't think it's even it, that souped up. I think it maybe made a change. He's made a couple of changes, in but, terms, of, especially in terms of mana base, because he got screwed base, yeah. in a lot, a lot of times playing that deck in terms of the mana base. Um, Eldrazi are powerful. The top-end Eldrazi are powerful. Now with this set, a lot of the more common Eldrazi powerful Mm -hmm. because if you look at some of the older eldrazi um they have very weird abilities like and when this enters the battlefield you may put a card an opponent owns in exile into their graveyard if you do draw a card Mm -hmm. and it's like that's on a five mana thing that's not it's got some utility it's not most of the time it's going to be like oh they had to exile this thing off of a uh off of a swords to plowshare earlier in the game yeah sure have it back but yeah now the ones that are coming out here like i mean we just talked about several it's where it's like oh mm-hmm. oh the combo potential the combo potential and eldrazi are their big downside is their mana cost mm-hmm. and eldrazi can be very good top ends for a lot of decks but because they're very heavily weighted on the higher end of the mana curve, that's that's their limitation. Mm-hmm. And so they don't go fast, but once they're around, they're a problem. Oh, yeah. So Eldrazi, I'm okay. I don't think they're too powerful. No. Uh, I think they are powerful, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Um, I, I kind of roll my eyes at Eldrazi decks a little bit. It's like, all right, fine. Ulalek's going to be fucking nuts. The backup commander for Ulalek is going to be more simple, but it's still a five-color Eldrazi deck. It's going to be nuts. Yeah. I would love... This is completely a side tangent, but the 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 playtest mystery booster card of the the Sliver, Eldra- the Sliver Eldrazi. The Sliver Eldrazi? The Sliver Eldrazi Overlord or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing a Sliver and Eldrazi tribal and make all my... All my uh, Sliver Eldrazi and all my Eldrazi slivers. That would be hilarious. Uh, but that's a little bit too much even for me. They're, they are, I would say, balanced. Especially in a commander environment. Asterisk. Asterisk here. The eight plus mana ones. Uh, when you cheat them in, it feels real good when you're playing it. And <laughs> really not good when you're not reanimating reanimating a 
fucking Kozilek yeah. or or an Ulamog or whatever is going to be ugh. it's going to be rough for everyone else at the table. Yeah. Uh, but it, uh, and of course the reason that they are featured in Modern Horizon 3 is because they've been a very popular thing in Modern. Mm-hmm. For That's that reason true. of like, yeah, you get them out, you're whoo, you're ending the game. In Commander, a little less so because you got, uh, three, you got three players. You got three players. A lot of interaction. Every hopefully. and every arc or not arc, eh, yeah, archetype or play style has something on that top end, whether mm-hmm. it is a, a big, you know, twelve mana bomb or it's I built this one mana thing up to be a million power, fear me sort mm-hmm. of idea. Oh my god, that's what I love about like uh what is it, Raga Draga, the like the go- uh, the yeah buff big big buff mana dorks and then top end good shit. Mm-hmm. That's what I like about my uh my rule zero partnered vampire commanders so that I can get you can get the token generator, you can do the whole thing, and then you got the top end reanimator that makes things very powerful. We'll get working on a YouTube video for that still. I feel like I've mentioned that like six weeks in a row. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll now move to the TikTok live chat. Sam, what do we got from the TikTok live? Friend, our friend Beardic Inspiration says, oh. hey guys. Hey Beardic. Hey. Uh, other than that, we have, this person's name is period. Uh, the, the. The word or the, the, the punctuation? Symbol, the punctuation symbol period. Interesting. Interesting. What's your favorite commander to play and what do they do? Mm. Mm. To play. That is an ever changing <laughs> that is an ever changing answer. My current favorite, much to sh- Sam's chagrin, is Abdel Adrian with the background of Candlekeep Sage. Mm-hmm. And that is all about flicker. Flicker are or, or blink effects are thing are effects where you take a card, you put it into exile, and then it returns to the battlefield. So you basically get an additional enters the battlefield. With Abdel Adrian, he himself is a flicker engine and target. So he can put a ton of my permanents into exile yep. until he leaves the battlefield. And so if I make him leave and enter via like an ephemerate, via a, uh, a cloud shift, that sort of thing, you can stack your own triggers and I can do all of the wonderful enter the battlefield effects that all of my permanents are doing. And then at the very end, resolve Abdel Adrian and put everything else under them, under him. And it gives me an additional benefit of when I shove a bunch of things under him, he creates that many 1-1 soldiers. Mm-hmm. Which you can also do your own 1-1 soldiers, which if you like swung with a bunch of them and they're tapped, you can then put them underneath and then you give them pseudo-vigilance because they come back untapped. Which is pretty cool. It's a pretty cool tech. Cool. And then Candlekeep Sage is the background. When you get that enchantment onto the battlefield, whenever your commander enters or leaves the battlefield, you draw a card. So every time you flicker him, he leaves, he returns. That's two card draw triggers. In addition to all of the other things you're doing, draw through a bunch of things. Uh, flicker flicker effects can go infinite, a million different ways. I can bounce a bunch of permanents. I can steal things. I can go through uh, the Undercity initiative. I can uh, so many fun things. So many fun things, and probably my most powerful deck right now. Uh, what about you? Probably my most favorite, though I haven't actually played it a lot, is uh, Slimefoot and Squee, mm-hmm. my Jund reanimator deck um for a while i was kind of playing it as a more classic get big things into the graveyard and then recur them i've started to move so slime foot and squee when they enter the battlefield or attack they create a uh, one one sapperling creature uh and then i can pay one and jund and sacrifice a sapperling to bring slime foot and squee and one other target creature back from my graveyard to the battlefield um recently i've started to go through that and take away some of the bigger top end things that don't necessarily jive um i know you had uh shielded the whispering one uh, i took her out i took her out because that wasn't it she's a very uh very uh heavy stacksy piece Mm -hmm. and it just wasn't like fun to be playing with people and be like all right you have one thing in play no you don't uh okay i'm the only one doing things at table so that was more of a a a pod okay a pod decision decision or, yeah, decision for the pod to have more fun. Uh, but no, I've been taking out things like there's the Tyranix Rex and uh, Anzrag, the Quake Mole, where these things would want to hit the battlefield and then they want to do their own thing by attacking. And I'm like, I'm finding myself just not getting value out of recurring them. 
So I've uh, taken some of those out and replaced them with uh, things that have better enter the battlefields or some lower power things that have some great die triggers because I'm killing my things a lot and milling my th it's. So right now I'm I'm kind of shifting the focus away from yeah just dropping big bombs to or recurring big bombs to recurring value pieces that are going to help me uh, kind of flood out my board uh, with with small creatures that can then attack. So what I'm hearing is we both like uh, enters the battlefield and leaves the battlefield things. I love sacrificing <laughs> my own things. I also love spell slinger. You do love spell slinger. Yeah, which is a little I get a little bit of that with Abdul Adrian. Narset would be my close very close second of my Jeskai spell slinger and that one's very fun as well. All right. That's all we have from the TikTok. That's all we got from the TikTok live chat. That is it for this, the Lord's episode 68 of the Duels of Mandorks podcast. You can catch us every other week live on TikTok. We record on Tuesdays. We post to the Patreon on Wednesday, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros, which you can join for free if you want to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas to the podcast. You can join for a dollar a month just to support us, five dollars a month to get the podcast early and ad free. That tier will never go up. We're sticking that at five dollars. We're not moving it because fuck the streaming services undercut them and if you want to support $15 or more a month you can get your name read at the end of the show like Brandon will Brandon Vole longtime fan of ours now friend even we've met him at a couple of uh, of events SCG cons in Cincinnati which is very fun uh, he is our he is our $15 and up patron so thank you Brandon for your support you're wonderful and we love you uh, you can also catch the podcast free the following Monday after it gets post on, posted on Patreon at podcast services around the globe and the video version on YouTube as well. Do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to say at all? Anything. Say something. Ban basic islands. Oh. Ooh, that's going to be really awkward when you cast the creature that turns everything into a basic it island. It really will. And then it's like, everyone DQ'd. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. I mean, Garth One Eye creates uh, can create be used to create a black lotus. That is true. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks. Anyway. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Happy price. Yeah.